Hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to the Popular Music Books and Process Series, a joint presentation of IASPM US, the Journal of Popular Music Studies and the Pop Conference. I'm Gus Stadler, one of the series organizers, along with my colleagues Kimberly Mack, Francesca Royster, Eric Weisbard, and Carl Wilson. You can find our schedule through the rest of the calendar year on the app, I'm your website um, and get on the mailing list for the series, emailing eric at eric.weisbard at gmail.com. You can also find previous presentations at Eric's YouTube channel, including last week's conversation between Karen Rose and Allison Fensterstock about Karen's book, Why Patty Smith Matters. Also in our next event uh, in two weeks, we look forward to a conversation between Shante, Shante Paradigm Smalls and Elliot Powell about Professor Smalls' new book, Hip Hop Heresies, Queer Aesthetics in New York City, which was just published by NYU Press. Today we have two eminent and accomplished scholars, each of whom is among other things, the author of monumental accounts of the history of live popular music in the US and the UK respectively. And we're very excited to have the opportunity to hear them discuss the aesthetics, social, and political demands of writing the history of live music with one another. So just for a quick bio of each of our guests, Steve Waxman is Elsie Irwin Sweeney, professor of music at Smith College. His publications include the books, Instruments of Desire, The Electric Guitar, and Shaping a Musical Experience, and This Ain't the Summer of Love, Conflict and Crossover in Heavy Metal and Punk the latter of which was awarded the 2010 Woody Guthrie Award for Best Scholarly Book on Popular Music by IASPM US. With Rebe Garofalo, he authored the sixth edition of the Rock History textbook, Rockin' Out, Popular Music in the USA. And with Ann Bennett, he co-edited the Sage Handbook of Popular Music. On WRSI Radio, the river in Western Massachusetts, he can be heard as the Doctor of Rock, offering bits of popular music history in support of Black History Month and Women's History Month. His latest book is Live Music in America, History from Jenny Lind to Beyonce, which will be published by Oxford University Press, uh, uh, I, on, I believe he said on July 8th, or ideally on July 8th, according to my sources. Um, um, Simon Frith is a professor emeritus at the University of Edinburgh, where he held the Tovey Chair of Music from 2005 to 2017. He's the author of Sound Effects, 1981, and Performing Rights, 1996, and was a longtime member of the editorial bo boards of the, journal, of the journals Popular Music and Screen. He also had a long career as a music journalist. He was a columnist for Cream and the Village Voice in the USA, and Melody Maker and the Scotsman in the UK. He was the first rock critic of the London Sunday Times and chaired the judging panel of the annual Mercury Music Prize, a charity chaired the judging panel of the annual Mercury Music Prize from its launch in 1992 until 2016. His most recent publication is A History of Live Music in Britain since 1950, published by Routledge in three volumes. Volume one covering 1950-1967 was published in 2013, volume two, 1968 to 1984 and 19, and volume three covering 1985 to 2015, published in 2021. So finally, uh, as always, please post your questions in the chat as they come to you during the conversation. Um, and in the last part of today's presentation, Eric will call on you to uh, ask your question out loud to the group. And please feel free to use the chat area for comments and chat as well. Um, we do advise the presenters not to be distracted by the chat. Um, we'll send you a copy of the chat later, the uh, transcript of the chat later. And I would like to just hang, hand things over to Steve and Simon. Simon, I think you need to unmute yourself again. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm uh, just going to thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you all for, for allowing me to attend this, this meeting and this series. Steve and I had some discussion about how we wanted to do this. And we decided it was worth having a general discussion about the various different ways in which we approach the history of live music and, and the effects of those um, with kind of number of, of questions that we would give our own answers to. And I thought the best place to start was to think about how it was we came to be interested in writing histories of live, a history of live music, because the origins of our histories have had quite a major effect on the difference between them, I think. 
So in my case, sometime earlier, early in the 2000s, I got involved with a couple of colleagues in writing a, a survey for a development agency in Scotland that wanted a map of the music industry in Scotland to see what its strengths and weaknesses were, what its relationship with, with the rest of the UK was, and in general, whether there were investments that, the, that, the, that this, this agency should be making. And while we were doing that research, we came to a conclusion that we hadn't expected to come to, that by far the most successful sector of music industries in Scotland was the live music sector, where promoters, venues, and, and the industry around live music. And that surprised us because in terms of popular music studies of which we were familiar, actually very little being written on the live music industry, specifically successful industry, as against all the work on the record industry, for example. So we decided that was worth following up. And again, this is very much a, a, a British perspective. In order to do this, we needed a research grant. And in order to get a research grant, we had a certain sort of structure we had to apply within. So effectively, we wanted three years worth of money, which would involve having a, an attached PhD student who had one sort of project, a, a, a lead researcher who would do the basic research, and then the, the, the two universities involved, Glasgow and Edinburgh, we would represent the sort of supervisors of. And so we had to decide how we were going to structure this before we'd even started the research as a research proposal. And we decided that the easiest and clearest way to organize it was to make it a history of promoters and promotion. And the, the, the focus would be on promoters and how the promoting business worked and how it had changed over a certain period of time. And <clears throat> proposal. The first was one of the things that interests us about live music is that it's always local. Live music happens in a particular place and most of the live music industry people we talked to in Scotland were organised around very specific scenes or venues. Um, therefore it was important that our research be able to pay proper attention to locality rather than just thinking in very general um, UK-wide terms. Um, and that meant that we decided to include an ethnography, observational interview study of particular places, which the PhD student would do. And the places we chose were Glasgow, um, Bristol, and Airfield. Um, the other thing that we took for granted from the beginning that we had to study, and again, I think this is very specific to Britain, is that the live music industry in Britain is interesting because it is significantly tied with state activity that the state is on the one hand, the thing that regulates how venues can work with all sorts of licensing, other, other laws, um, but also is a major promoter, um, particularly through arts councils, but also through for cities like Glasgow ownership of major venues and therefore having a particular policy around those venues, supporting them in various ways. So we decided that, um, that we would focus, as well as focusing promoters as in the promoting industry on localities and local venues, we'd also pay proper attention to the role of the state in shaping how the live music industry works. Um, now, having got that far, we had to have two questions which we had to think about a bit before we actually wrote the research proposal. The first was, how do you define live music? Um, which, is, which can be a tricky question, but for us, it seemed to be a fairly simple answer to say, we define live music as any gathering of people in a public place in order to listen to music. And so that means that from the music would be absolutely separate from what we were writing about. And I think there were two reasons for this. First is that in the history of popular music live, popular music in, in Britain. Dance and dance halls are always absolutely central. And the only really good academic book that had been written on the music industry um, up to that time was a historical Jane Goode history of dance halls and the dance hall industry in the pre-war period. So having thought of dance as being central, we wrote out then clearly the fact that dances these days were organized about the playing of records and the performance of DJs didn't mean they were any less lively than, than, the, than the concerts and so on we were looking at. So from the very beginning, we included um, 
um, <clears throat> recorded music being used to dancing to as a form of live music. Um, the second point we had to decide is when to start, where we start the history. And this was, again, fairly straightforward. We decided that the obvious break in the way in which history of music in Britain had worked, particularly if you're looking at it from an industrial perspective, was the Second World War, um, which caused a huge hiatus in the industry and, uh, and it ceased to be able to exist in like the way it had done before. So we decided if we start in 1950, which was after the worst effects of the war and subsequent austerity and so on, were beginning to change. Um, and that make a sensible start point. We also had a, a more um, a more practical thing, which was, which was promoters from the 1950s were still alive and therefore would still be possible to interview in oral history terms. It's going to be much harder to talk to promoters from the war period. Um, and then finally, which we never really discussed, but we, it didn't really become an issue, is that we always took it for granted, uh, it would be necessary in this sort of research project, to say that we were interested in live music in general. This was not a history of popular music as such, although that was the focus, because that was where the interesting history happened in some ways. But we would cover all sorts of live music, um, classical music, folk music, jazz, variety, and so on. And um, it, in it was this way of framing the research proposal um, that <clears throat> shaped the research we did and therefore shaped how the books, how they were, how they were organized. So essentially, to, to sum that up, um, we decided we would have a, an essentially chronological history. And it was only later on when we realized that we couldn't, a chronological history of all our material be a hugely long book. And we had to persuade a publisher to publish it in three volumes. So we had a second set of issues which is how you divided volume one, two, and three. Um, so that has been effects, but I won't go into that now. But hand over to Steve, who I think had a very, very different starting point for his research. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Um, yeah, I mean, I think our processes were different in a lot of ways. And I know we were going to talk a little later on about the difference between the US and England uh, as context. And, I'll say one thing now, which I think we'll come back to, which is you mentioning that you, your initial idea for researching this came from being asked to do a sort of study on behalf of basically the government, right? Like nobody ever asked me to do that. <laughs> uh, and I know that when I went to the conference that you and your colleagues organized on the business of live music, and there was so much talk about live music in the state. And it's not like it doesn't matter in the US context, but it definitely doesn't matter in the same way. Um, but, and, and by the same token, like in terms of funding, I had no state funding. I had no funding basically to do my book at all, except for the usual funding that a faculty member has, which is sabbatical time and, you know, like some research funds from my university. So, but in terms of like more of the conceptual side of like, where did I get the idea to write a history of, American live music. Um, I think a lot of the motivation came from the outgrowth of some of the earlier research I had done, and specifically in my second book, um, The Saint, the Summer of Love on metal and punk. The first chapter was about, um, to a large degree, arena rock, and specifically about Grand Funk Railroad and arena rock. And in thinking through the issues that surrounded Grand Funk Railroad in the early 70s, I had become really captivated by both the sort of specific significance that a, a particular type of concert had on the way that people were thinking about the work that popular music did. You know, like what did it mean that suddenly it was totally normal for people to be paying to sit in crowds of 20,000 day after day and week after week as bands were on tour in a way that had never really happened before in such a routine manner. And I was very intrigued with how that marked a change in popular music culture that I didn't think anyone had really had ever addressed very well. And then Grand Funk Railroad became this band that embodied a lot of what that change meant. And that's why I decided to write about them. And I saw that as being very much tied in to some of the changes that also gave rise to the genre of heavy metal in the early 70s. And that's one of the arguments I made in that book. But as I did that research, 
I also found myself asking a lot of questions about just how new what was happening in the 70s was. Like, okay, I'm making all these assumptions that like it was really unusual for audiences to want to pay to sit in a sports arena and be part of a crowd of 20,000 or 12,000 or whatever and enjoy that experience in that particular way as opposed to say going to a club which of course also kept happening but I was especially intrigued at the arena phenomenon as a particular sort of historical shift but then I wanted to understand that shift more in historical terms and so I started to think about like what's the sort of prehistory of arena rock where would one go to find that how could I start to uh, locate some things that would help to create a genealogy of the stuff that I saw changing in the 1970s. Um, and at that point, I started digging pretty deep into my early grad school training. And when I was a grad student in history at the University of North Carolina in 1990, 91, 92, I was an advisee of a professor named John Casson, who some folks on this call might know of great cultural historian. Um, I TA'd for his cultural history or popular culture in the U.S. class. And one of the things he assigned in that class was PT, were excerpts of P.T. Barnum's autobiography, Struggles and Triumphs. And I remembered reading that and I remembered reading about Jenny Lind. And it was like this thing from 20 years ago when I was like a baby grad student. I was like, that's a thing that might be worth going back to. And so I went back to my old copy of Struggles and Triumphs and I reread it. And I immediately decided that I was gonna make a trip to the American Antiquarian Society, which is actually just about an hour away here in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I spent a week looking at like newspapers from the 1850s and reading about Jenny Lind in primary sources that I had never looked at before. Because prior to that point, I'd been very much a 20th century popular culture historian. And it was completely exciting for me to dig into this time period that I had never gotten my hands dirty with. So that was a big motivation for me. It was like, I was kind of tired of writing about rock and I wanted to kind of deepen my own knowledge of popular music history and of American cultural history more generally. Um, as I started to read about Lind and about the way that she was drawing like six, 8,000 people to her concerts in 1850, and she had all this publicity around her and was basically being turned into an 1850 version of a pop star, I was like, okay, I think I found one beginning of the story that I want to tell. And that was something I didn't necessarily, well, I guess I kind of anticipated that because I decided that she was worth looking into, but the extent of the material I found surprised me. Um, and so I just dived in. I was like, this is part of, this is gonna be, whatever I am writing now, this is gonna be part of it. Um, from there, so I decided at that point, you know, Simon said that he and his cohort decided to start their project in the post-World War II era. Um, I decided to start mine very much, um, in the middle of the 19th century. And a big part of my motivation there beyond just the fact that I thought the story of Lind was compelling and worth digging into for my purposes was that as I started to think a little more broadly about like, if I'm writing about live music, what am I really writing about? Um, one of the things I came to terms with was the claim that has been made by a number of different cultural studies and popular music scholars that live music as such didn't exist until the point at which recordings were a dominant force, right? And so one person who's made this claim is uh, Philip Auslander in his book, Liveness, but there are others who have made a very similar claim. And it's, to my mind, it become a kind of conventional wisdom that like the phrase live music really didn't exist until there was something that wasn't live music that it could be counterpoised to. And I was not entirely convinced that it was that straightforward. So I wanted to go to the point before recordings were an established medium so I could look at what, to my mind, was live music prior to that point and see how much of a difference recordings made if I actually looked at that larger history. So that was a big part of the motivation for pushing the start date so far back, like back into the 19th century and not starting it at some other sort of point. 
Um, it, that also then raised the question of definition, right? And Simon discussed how his um, research team had to deal with that. And for me, uh, I thought a lot about like, again, like if I'm writing about live music, what am I writing about? Uh, what is liveness? And I mean, again, Auslander's work was a big starting point for me. Um, but it was something that I both are, took very much from and also argued against in certain regards. Um, and I thought as I considered what my subject was, a big part of what I settled on and part of how I justified starting the book when I did uh, was that what I was really writing about was about the public life of music. And that live music was about the way that music existed as a public phenomenon or the way that music created a sense of being part of a public. You know, so obviously Habermas informed some of that um, and more recent work uh, such as Richard Bush, who's done a couple of books that are really significant on the history of American audiences, not just in music, but also in theater and other modes. Lawrence Levine's Highbrow Lowbrow uh, was crucial in helping me put some of the pieces together. Um, and through all of this, I think what was driving my sense of purpose and why I thought it was worth writing a book as big as the one I wrote was the same sense that Simon had that like this was this topic that really had not been done justice to that popular music studies had really become to a degree that I thought was not balanced the study of recorded music and I thought there was a lot to say about what live music was and why it mattered that had not been said so I set out to tell a big story unlike Simon I did not decide to break my story up into three books. <laughs> so instead I wrote one book that's 700 pages long. Um, and I think it's actually decent. You know, y'all can tell me when, if, you, if and when you get around to looking at it. Uh, but for me, it was really important to tell a big story. I thought there was a big story to tell. I didn't want to downsize it. And I was very lucky that I found a publisher with Oxford University Press who was willing to let me do that. Uh, so that's my version of how I got into the project and how I defined it for myself once I really started working on it. Um, I should say, given your last point, I'm extremely jealous of your book because in the ideal world, I would love to have done a book without having a research team and research grant story about and being able to have one book have a kind of different sort of flow. And I do think your book is, is it, it, you know, it's just a, a wonderful version, a wonderful example of what can be done um, with that sort of that sort of long history, um, which 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 was not really what we were attempting. And I want to come back to some of those things later. I thought the other thing, just more of an introduction, to give some flavour of what we wrote about. Is we, we should each say something about having finished our books. What were the things that we kind of found ourselves writing about? Well, discovering or mm -hmm. focusing on that most surprised us. So again, to begin, um, these are the things that I found of unexpected significance. I wouldn't have thought about at all when we started in the history of live music. The first is the role of alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. And that has a lot of different things to say about it. But I mean, one of the first things that absolutely staggered me, and I thought I knew a lot, was that if you think about the Beatles, performing in the cavern, or you think about famous London jazz club, Ronnie Scott's club, um, which pioneered a particular sort of jazz club in Britain. I had never realized that they did not sell alcohol, that they were not licensed to sell alcohol, and that much of live music in the 1950s was not in spaces where alcohol was allowed to be sold. Um, it was interesting from the point of view that these days, alcohol is absolutely central to how the live music business funds itself. So it's very interesting that you could have a live music business, a live music setup, which didn't depend on alcohol sales. So that in itself was, was interesting about quite how that shifted. Um, and I won't go into all the details of, of, the, of what was going on in, in the 50s, but I would say that what you can say is that the problems of selling alcohol and the problems of how it's licensed and how it's controlled through various sorts of local and national state regulations has been absolutely central to the history of live music since that period. 
So from pub, the importance of pubs as basic, most significant venues in small towns and in big towns from the late 1950s to the present day is absolutely obvious, not just with pub rock, but every other sort of music. If you were to look at an ad over the last 40 to 50 years in Britain, we're looking for a jazz club or a, or a folk club, you would find that the vast majority of them are describing a night that's held every week in a pub. You know, there's a pub room and the folk club meets in that pub. The first folk club I ever went to um, when, I was, when I was a teenager in York was an upstairs room in, in the pub. Um, and it was interesting because I was under age for drinking, but you could go to the upstairs room because the bar wasn't in the room, you bought your drinks from, from downstairs. And that remains an absolute model. If you look at the history of music festivals in Britain, the absolutely crucial um, sponsoring, the, the kind of source of funding, which is absolutely essential, is selling of what's, what are called pouring rights. The brewer who has the rights to sell all the drinks. So tea in the park, famous Scottish festival. The tea stands for Tenants Brewery, who ever since it started, have been the basics, the basics source of sponsorship to keep that festival going. And that's true when we were looking at even the most small festivals. One of the first things they have to do is negotiate with a drinks company to have the rights to sell the drinks in the festival site. Um, there are lots of, I mean, other things. Once you start looking into that way, you start looking at pubs as being a source of live music. And of course, that's not just rock music. It meant we became interested in working men's clubs, the whole history of variety and the, and the way that changed. But there are also interesting moments like, first of all, with Northern Soul dance scene, and then later on with, with the whole rave scene. Those were cultures that did not involve drinking. They involved taking either speed or ecstasy. And what was interesting is that this deeply worried the drinks industry um, because they were losing, they felt they were losing income. So in a sense, they were competing with drugs and they were among the kind of key campaigners for the regulation of, and, you know, the banish, banning of B and the regulation of raves, et cetera, et cetera. But also, and something else I never realized, um, it led them to develop alco pops, which I don't know if they call that in the States, which are sweet alcoholic drinks aimed at teenagers to get teenagers to go on drinking alcohol and to kind of move it away from the, from the, from the kind of this association with old men sitting in pubs. And just to go back a bit, it was going back to, in the fifties, pub, pubs weren't the places for people to go and hit music. In the jukebox industry in Britain, jukeboxes that were put in place in the 1950s were put in coffee bars, they weren't put in pubs because that's where teenagers were thought to go in pubs with for old people. Um, so that was meant that all the way through our histories, we found that thinking about alcohol sales, the alcohol companies, how they're regulated, how laws change, how late you can stay in, a, you know, how late opening hours are, who's allowed to buy drugs, et cetera, et cetera. All those bits of legislation became crucial to how dance and life venues evolved. The second thing I would say was absolutely crucial in the history, which I wasn't expecting, is students. Um, students and students in all sort of universities and equivalent age places, art schools, conservatories, and everywhere else, have been crucial for the development of live music in a number of ways. In the 1950s, um, art schools, for example, were absolutely crucial for the development of folk, jazz, and uh, blues, and then from blues into early forms of rhythm and blues and, and British beat as sources of both musicians, but more particularly the audiences and the rehearsal spaces and the places to play. Um, in the 1970s, the rise of rock, the venues, the, among the only suitable venues around the country were student unions and universities. And the people who booked in bands and student unions, um, known as entertainment officers, they became, they became the major promoters in, in Britain ever since. If you look at any of the sort of most significant British promoters, they all started out as student promoters promoting gigs in, in their universities. So the whole kind of rock, the whole development of the, of the rock live music industry came out of that scene. And then even as that shifted in universities, for lots of reasons I won't go into, I'm no longer the source of that sort of live music, university students are still seen as absolutely crucial as the market for the development of clubs and clubbing and dances. It's particularly obvious, in, obviously in, in big university towns like Edinburgh, where the university, the university presence is what 
sustains a huge number of, of dance clubs. So, so students was the second thing. The third thing, which this is very about it, is that the history of live music in Britain since 1950 can't be disentangled from the history of the BBC. The BBC has been absolutely crucial, not just as a place where you can hear live music, um, but because um, under the peculiar regulations of the BBC, it wasn't allowed to have all its music program being provided by records. It had to have studio live music sessions. So, I mean, the Beatles played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of live gigs in, in BBC studios um, <clears throat> before they, you know, before they became kind of global superstars. But all the way through, studio sessions have been the way in which people start and get some of their earliest live music, live music experience, knowing they're playing to an audience, having to learn to play together and so on. But also the BBC is a major funder of live music. I mean, all, this last week we had Glastonbury. Now Glastonbury, every single Glastonbury performance was on the BBC and they're paying, they're paying a lot of money for that sort of right. So it becomes a kind of BBC event in a particular sort of way. So this relationship between radio and live music is very striking and again something that I hadn't expected. And then finally, this isn't such a big theme, but it, it kind of jolted me. I was amazed by how much violence there was in, live, in the history of live music in Britain. Violence between um, I mean, violence from the point of view of the police trying to regulate um, illegal festivals or illegal clubs or raves or whatever. Violence in dance halls, particularly, but also other sorts of clubs, which meant that very early on, a significant part of the live music industry was the bouncer. And there have been endless problems historically with the violence of bouncers and how you control the violence of, of bouncers and security men. In the 70s and 80s, particularly around other things that were happening in politics, particularly the rise of the National Front and other sorts of racist organizations, the amount of violence in clubs was just, and, and, and Rockies was absolutely astounding. I mean, I lived through it, I just, we just took it for granted. Um, but fights would break out and you had to be always aware if you went to a dance, to a dance hall, that you knew where the nearest exit was, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, that, that was good for us because it made us think that there were problems in live music. It wasn't all everybody <laughs> having this lovely community. And it was, you know, and going back to what you were saying about this sort of, it was a it was a way of music kind of creating the way the public was, but we have to remember the public wasn't all sweetness and light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> um, I mean, and that in a sense is part of what the study of live music brings that's so interesting is precisely like conflict is throughout it. I mean, in the you know context of Jenny Lind, for instance, I mean, she performs in the US a year after the Astor Place riot uh, which was a huge conflagration that led to over 20 deaths. And there were at least two or three pretty significant riots during her concert tours. Um, and, you know, I think that doesn't jive with the image of Jenny Lynn that people often think of if they know of her at all. Uh, but she was a very contested figure and, and her performances were very contested. Uh, Gus knows this well as somebody else who's written about her very uh, knowingly. So. Um, I think, you know, I would just echo what Simon's saying here about how this is definitely in neither of our books do you get this sense of idealized community as being the thing that live music gives rise to. I think it's a much more complex uh, phenomenon. So in terms of things I reflect back on that either surprise me or that I find, you know, especially have provoked me having now gotten on the other side of this project, I mean, you know, there's a few different levels of things that come to mind. Um, I mean, some of it just stems from specific sources I found, like um, I gave a paper about this recently at the ISPM US conference that like, you know, I was not looking for anything having to do with rock and roll in the 19th century, but I found this one review of a minstrel performance from 1878 that made reference to a song titled Rock and Roll Them. And it was, I mean, I don't know of any other minstrel song from the 1870s that uses the phrase rock and roll in the title. It really seemed like a pretty wild discovery. I still don't really know what to do with it. I do mention it in the book as a sort of preface to the chapter on rock and roll concerts, but 
I mostly put it in there just because I did, I was like, I have to share this with people, even though I really don't have anything more to say about it, except look at this cool thing I found, you know, and there were definitely other things like that, that I wanted to share, some of which I think have a more clear kind of significance. Um, you know, getting back to this question of like, when do you start to actually see talk of a thing called live music emerge? Um, you know, and this notion that like it emerges with the with the sort of entrenchment of recording as a sort of um, dominant mode of musical production. I I found um, a uh, mention of live songs and live singing in an ad from a 1906 uh, issue of the New York Clipper, which based on the various narratives of when live music starts to become a conventional term was much earlier than I think any of the available scholarship would ever have suggested you would have started to see that kind of rhetoric being used. Um, and it's the sort of thing that like, if you're not researching the subject, this might not seem like the biggest discovery, but to me, it was a big discovery. And it was one that I thought, had some weight because it wasn't an isolated discovery. So I could also kind of back it up with other things to show that, in fact, by the time you get into the 19 teens and 20s, when we certainly have recordings as a prevalent thing, but where they're not dominant. And the discourse on live music in that time period wasn't all just preoccupied with the difference between recorded music and live music, although a lot of it was. And that was a very formative discourse. But being able to actually like trace with some precision when you start to see the terminology evolve, um, for me, that was really important to do. And the stuff I found was surprising. Um, in, a, in a related vein, doing research in things like artist contracts, you find stuff that you really don't find anywhere else. And so I was really intrigued to find, for instance. And, and I think it's also about like, where do you find the good stuff, right? Sometimes it's not where you might expect. So I went to the Hogan Jazz Archive at Tulane University, which is an amazing resource. Um, they have this huge collection um, of the papers of Nick LaRocca, who was the main guy in the original Dixieland Jazz Band. Now, you know, if you were of a certain mindset, you might think like original Dixieland jazz band, are they even worth doing research on? Like they're that white group that's always claimed as having invented jazz that we should be pushing back against. So like maybe we shouldn't even include them in the narrative, but I don't work that way. I'm like, you know, there's gotta be something here. There's like boxes upon boxes of material. I'm gonna look at it. And sure enough, I start looking at these contracts that the original Dixieland jazz band had with Ryzen Weber's Caf Cabaret, the club that they started playing in in New York starting in 1917. And one of the contracts from 1918 specifically like says, you guys need to be coming in and playing jazz music every night. So like a live music performance contract specified in 1918 that a group had to come in and play jazz at a time when jazz as a term was barely even established. I thought that was fascinating. Um, and what I took from it, and I saw a similar thing play out with regard to rock and roll, is that contract language is actually one of the places where these terms we use, like jazz and rock and roll, gets turned into something conventional. And to see that happening in live music performance contracts, I think showed the degree to which live performance was setting the terms according to which we were describing the music of the day in a way that had not been recognized before. Um, and so that was something that for me was a real takeaway. Um, the, when was the writer introduced? Well, that was kind of a writer in 1917, 1918. I don't know that I've seen too many prior to that point. I don't, I can't say I've like exhaustively like um, researched the history of writers. But I can say you started to see things like that by that time. Um, it's a great question. The, the last thing I'll say in terms of like things that were kind of surprising or that like I took away as having, you know, seen a sort of evolution I didn't necessarily expect. You know, having started with Jenny Lind, it's something that again, I would sort of echo with Simon is like, my book isn't just about rock. My book isn't just about popular music. I was very inclusive. 
So there are parts of the book where I talk about classical music. There's a lot of the book devoted to jazz. I talk about vaudeville. I talk about uh, like not minstrelsy in the early, early history, but minstrelsy in the latter day period of like 1880s, 1890s, um, along with rock and roll, along with hip hop. Um, and so taking that wide angle lens, which was really crucial for me in terms of just really doing justice to the subject. Um, one thing I saw is that I think, um, particularly with regard to understanding both the interrelationship of classical and popular music, or to put it a different way, high and low, that live music has been a really crucial space for seeing those boundaries shift and get redefined. And that they've been a lot more porous and slippery for a lot longer than I think a lot of the established histories have suggested. You know, so you read Lawrence Levine, you know, which of course is a book that's almost 40 years old now, but, and he makes it sound like once you get to the late 19th century, that boundary is just there. Um, and he uses Jenny Lind as an example of when the boundary was less there, right? And so there's this very much before and after. But you go into the 1920s and 30s where you've got Paul Whiteman doing his, you know, modern music thing at Aeolian Hall. Um, but you've also got like Arthur Toscanini basically becoming a pop star and becoming a huge personality on NBC radio. And you've got people working on the promotion side of classical music, like Saul Hurok. And I don't know how many folks have heard of Saul Hurok, but Saul Hurok was basically like Bill Graham, the concert promoter's hero. He was a Jewish immigrant from Russia who came over in 1905 and his life work became promoting culture and he promoted dance and he promoted music. Um, most of what he promoted was classical music and ballet. Most of it was from Eastern Europe, but he was the promoter for Benny Goodman at Carnegie Hall in 1938. And I found that 14 years before the Benny Goodman concert, he promoted another jazz concert in 1924 featuring Vincent Lopez that nobody else has ever written about anywhere that I've found. And for me, looking at a career like that, and I, I, I think Simon's project reveals very similar things. Like when you look not just at the performers, but at who's laying the groundwork and the infrastructure for what live music is, what you see is that you can't make a lot of the categorical distinctions that we usually make around the music that people who are working to promote the music are working to promote it in every way they can. And that doesn't just mean that sometimes Saul Hurok promoted some things that were popular music, even though he was mainly a classical music promoter, but it also meant that when he promoted classical music, he was doing it because he wanted it to be popular. And I think that's a really important thing for us to keep in mind that when you put it down to like, what's the market share that these people are going for, in the live music sphere, um, there was there have been moments of surprising parity between what we think of as high and low cultures. And I think that might encourage us to rethink some of the ways in which we um, think about some of the narratives that we place around the larger stories that we tell. Yes, I completely agree. I mean, something I was going to go on to was why I think I mean, what sort of challenges live music, studying live music makes to the kind of orthodoxes of popular music studies. And I put very generally, just following up what Steve said, that I think there's a tendency in popular music studies to have a sort of set of clear boundaries. So genres become a very significant aspect of how we think about music, different genres, where they came from, how they relate to other genres. Careers, we tend to think of the sort of classic career moving up and becoming a star, sort of, um, and even identities of fans, of people who are, you know, have a, who are fans of a particular sort of music and buy those records and so on. And if you look at live music, it just sort of really doesn't work like that. It's much harder to pin down genre distinctions. And you only have to think of, you know, if you're in a small town and there's one good venue, any sort of music that's got any sort of audience is going to appear at that venue. And that venue has to be used to dealing with all sorts of different audiences. And those audiences are often very, very overlapping. You know, there's not a clear answer. There's one sort of audience, and there's another sort of audience, another sort of audience. And I got particularly fascinated in musicians' careers and how much they were not genre, you know, how much they were not genre determined. 
I mean, I've recently written something about this and others haven't really thought that he wasn't, didn't preach too much in our book. But if you look at the career of John Paul Jones from late 70s, he's played an astonishing variety of different sorts of musicians, still does, and he's appeared on the stage in, in an opera, in the Royal Opera, Covent Garden. And he's played with avant-garde performers like Diamanda Gallas. He's played with kind of um, avant-garde rock bands and jazz bands. He played with Led Zeppelin, obviously. He was probably one of the great session musicians of his, of his era who played on everything. And if you look at him, you can't really say, you know, he's a rock musician. He is a mu musician who sees the opportunities that came along his way. And over history, for all musicians, those opportunities keep changing. Um, and the other thing I, we were very struck by, again, from local friends, is that the career structure, the difference between amateurs and professionals is actually quite complicated. So you get people start out obviously as amateurs, and then they become, as a, as a great book by the, the Hollies very early on in their career about the crucial thing about British beat was the semi-pro, the people who were almost professional but still couldn't make a living. Um, and eventually they get a record contract and they can start to make a living. But eventually that, that career goes and they kind of go down again. And so in the small town I live in, in England at the moment, there are, there are people in their 60s and 70s playing in kind of rock bands in pubs who are probably the same people who were playing those rock bands, same music, those same pubs 40 years ago, went off and had a career and got record contracts and now are back playing the same music in the same pubs. And it's like a kind of, it, it, it's not as simple going like that. There's a lot of up and down and, into, you know, and, and crossing over with other musicians. And I think it's very hard to see those sorts of things when you're focusing on records or on airplay and all these sorts of things, because that, that's not what they're concerned with. Um, particularly record companies are concerned with kind of packages. And I think live music promoters are much more, you know, they obviously promote packages, but they're much more concerned about keeping their, keeping their venue full whatever it takes to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, I will say that the focus on promoters that for me came not, I didn't have quite the same sense when I started that that was gonna be such a big focus the way that Simon articulated for his project, but it became much more of a focus of my project over time, because I think I had the same recognition that Simon and his co-authors had, that they are a big part of the story. Uh, and that along with the work of other folks who actually make performances happen, this was so much a part of what um, I, I saw as being the stuff that had not been documented before, you know, and I, I think we now see, like, I know grad students who are doing work on sound engineers and doing work on lighting people, but at the time that I think we both started doing our projects, you really couldn't find any of that work. And finding good resources for it was also challenging, right? So um, definitely a big motivating factor for me, not having done the sort of extensive interview work that Simon and his research team did. Like I, most of, almost all of my work was based on archival research. And so it was really like kind of, um, if I found anything archival about people who were working behind the scenes in live music, it was very fortuitous. Um, but there were some collections that were very motivating, uh, and I think this very much speaks to the challenges of doing research on live music. But, um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame had some really crucial materials in their archive. Um, I think some of the best came from a guy named Jules Fisher, who uh, had worked as a Broadway lighting designer before getting involved in rock and roll. He won multiple Tony Awards. He was the original lighting designer for the uh, musical Hair. And so he already had some experience working in rock related stuff, but he got drafted in to actually do rock concert design, like not just lighting design, but actually production design. And with Alex Cooper, he worked with David Bowie, he worked with Kiss, he worked with Parliament Funkadelic. And there's about three boxes of his materials that were left to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, and there's about three other, three or four other figures of comparable experience who left some of their papers at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Being able to see that stuff was amazing for me. It was one of the things that really allowed me 
to not just write a history of live music as this is what happened at this concert on the stage, but to really be like, here's how people were thinking about what it meant to produce an event. And I think that gets to another side of what Simon was describing about like the work that promoters do, um, what it means to sell an event, what it means to produce an event. What is an event? You know, an event has so many moving parts to it that I think many of us who just attend them don't see. Um, so one of the things that I was very much hoping to do was to try to make some of that more transparent. Um, so those archives I found at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame were crucial in that regard. Um, there's another promoter, Alex Cooley, who was one of the main promoters in Atlanta, uh, Georgia during the 1960s, 70s, 80s. He left his papers to Georgia State University. So I made a special trip to Atlanta just to look at his papers. And again, was able to get material from that that I would never have gotten otherwise. Um, and some of the stuff you find in there is like, it's, it's some of, sometimes it's the most utterly mundane stuff that is the most fascinating. So for me, one of the most giddy responses I had to any piece of um, arcane material I found in one of those archives was um, a brochure for a trucking company. You know, and I actually wound up writing like a five page section on this trucking company in one of the chapters because who the hell thinks about the importance of trucking and live music, right? But like, you don't have concert tours without trucks. I mean, at a certain point it was trains, but in the 1970s it's trucks. So I think it was in Jules Fisher's files that there's like this trucking company brochure and they are selling themselves as like, we move rock. That's like their, um, that's their catchphrase, right? And I was just like, this is precisely the stuff that you need to understand to really understand what makes live music work. And, and I, I think in my intro, this is something I say, is that this book at root, one of my driving questions is that basic question, like, what makes live music work? Um, how does it actually happen? And, you know, I don't want to say like, I did... Well, I think one thing that Simon's book and my book have very much in common, or Simon's projects, is, his is three books, mine is one, but that our projects very much have in common is a lot of work to sort of demystify that sense of what the live music event is. Um, and I think that goes along with what we've been saying about how the usual categories we think of, of like rock, jazz, classical, whatever, just don't fit. Um, but a whole new set of categories come into play instead, like the promoter, um, the stage manager, you know, so it's, it's categories of, um, occupation <laughs> as opposed to categories of musical distinction. I think one, um, kind of final thing I was going to say, but I'd be curious to know your views on is, it's, it's in a sense, <clears throat> The problems of being an academic historian of this material mm. because there's no doubt that live music lives on for many people in memory mm -hmm. and you know when you're talking about interviewing people or when we interview people we were aware that even promoters remember things which aren't actually true um you have to be quite careful but on the other side of that is um when you're talking about finding these unexpected kind of treasure troves of material we found a lot of this material is very localized. So you'll get some local fanatic in a very small town who's over the years has listed every single gig that's happened in a particular pub, interviewed the publicans and everybody's arrived. Mm. So it's amazing material, which is not at all academic, um, but you have to use it. But we did find, and I found particularly when I've given talks, you know, when our books came out to, 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 to reading groups or book festivals or whatever, that people are very, very engaged. But they think their own knowledge and their own history is infinitely superior to what we've done. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they remember, and you say, well, it wasn't actually open when you were 12, so you can't put them there when you were 12. But doesn't, that doesn't put them off thinking they were there when they were 12. And I think that became, for me, a very interesting aspect of how much live music matters to people in, in the way they remember certain sorts of friendships, certain sorts of activities. And we became very fascinated in the ethnographic work about how when 
you know, when people go to a live music event, the event which you were just talking about is not just the period they're actually in the venue. It's the whole way they plan about going, where they meet, who they meet, you know, how they how they arrange with what they're going to do, or how they talk about it afterwards, how they share memories. And the event becomes part of a kind of overarching memory in their life of a particular sort of moment of friendship or to a group of people who are friendly with, which the live music become is the focus of other things that are going on around it. Um, in the history, it became fascinating to see how different sorts of events created those effects. And I suppose what we came to think was that live music has to be understood as something that's both very ordinary and very extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So much live music is very routine. You know, you go out on a Friday or Saturday night to the pub or the club. Every summer now you go to Glastonbury or whatever festival you go to. And then it's like, you know, live music's always been essential to holidays <clears throat> and to weekends. And one of the things, again, which is very obvious, I know this is definitely true in North America, weddings are absolutely crucial for live musicians' careers. You know, if, you know we found that people from every genre, you know, have play, played weddings from classical music to punk. You know, this was one of the sources of income at the local level for people. And the wedding becomes organized around a particular sort of live music experience. So on the one hand, it's like live music is part of the routine of everyday life, but it's part of a routine which takes on a kind of special significance. And that in certain circumstances, people remember as actually transcending the everyday and providing something they've never experienced before or since. I think that tension is very hard to get at in a, in a history when you're just talking to promotions or talking to promoters. Um, because it tends to bring it down to just the, the sort of, as you say, the, how the event is planned and everything. But it was very interesting just to finish this, that promoters, when we asked them what was the best gig they've ever did, done, they never said the one that made them the most money. They often said, well, it was a gig that didn't make us any money at all, in fact, almost bankrupted, but it was the most magical evening, everything worked, except for the gate. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting, it was like, even within quite jaded promoters, the sense that live music was something that wasn't just about, you know, just about the economic calculations they made in putting it on. Yeah, um, just I, I think I'm going to just add one thing because I know we're getting ready to go into Q&A. So I just want to add one quick anecdote about how things matter to people, but also how often information gets lost in translation or in transmission. Um, you know, I'm going to come back to Jenny Lynn, who, among other things, um, she has a very particular sort of connection to where I live, Northampton, Massachusetts, because um, she performed here in 1851, and there's a lot of local lore about her appearance and about she apparently stayed here for about three months and honeymooned here after she got married while she was on tour in the U.S. Um, and People say that she gave this place one of its main names, which is like Paradise City, um, which I just recently had somebody say is wrong. Uh, but the thing that I always hear that's wrong is that people who know about Jenny Lynn's connection to where I live, the thing I always hear is, oh yeah, she played at the Academy of Music back in that, you know, when she played in Northampton. Our Academy of Music, in town wasn't built until 1890 and she came here in 1851 and yet everybody thinks that she played at the academy of music um so i've had more conversations than i can recount where basically i have that exchange well actually the academy of music didn't exist when she came to town and so actually she played at first church which is a church that does still exist in town, although probably it didn't exist in the same building that she performed in at that time. That part, I don't exactly know. But the fact that A, people still, you know, this isn't even memory, right? This is like folklore yeah. at this point. Um, and everybody still has a sort of folkloric collective memory that Jenny Lind is part of the history of Northampton, but part of that memory is based on a completely wrong presumed fact. <laughs> you know, uh, and I feel a little almost guilty when I have to correct you, you know, like, I'm sorry, but no, you're wrong, you know, but that's maybe, what being a historian is. 
maybe maybe you can finesse it and say without her they wouldn't have wanted the building or something exactly um, <laughs> so on to the questions and we'll start off with gail oh my god you like put me on the spot and i was all right that's the first question i did you put me other I'm scrolling to my question again there were so many other stuff i thought i must be like the fifth question hold on you oh beat Anne. it never happens Go oh my for god it. well okay there was a little bit of discussion before i'm i'm sorry i should um well sorry i i i, I love i love listening to this while i also prep dinner um which is why it's very very i a lot that way anyway thank you this is a fantastic um, discussion from two amazing scholars. I was curious about the relation of live, like kind of, this is really a philosophical question or a kind of methodological question for you, is the distinction between live music and everyday music. Um, the idea of, you know, kind of yeah, like how you made a distinction and now someone walked in the door and the dog is going to start barking. So I'll stop there. So I should give the microphone. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'll let you answer that that question if you know what I mean about the idea of the everyday. Mm -hmm. Simon, do you want to take that first? You you were just talking about the everyday. <laughs> yeah, I I mean I think I think that the other way around. I think that everyday life for most of us and for most people in most societies um, involves music as part of how the everyday is organized and thought about. And it may be just like going to church and hearing music at the weekend, going to a football match and hearing people <clears throat> singing along with other people. But music is part of how we deal and we deal with what you might call sociability in everyday life. Um, now, live music doesn't necessarily mean live music in any sort of commercial sense. It can just mean singing in the playground, as a, you know, just everyday music in that sort of way. But on the other hand, I think everyday life, not everyday life includes within its definition, special moments. And I think on the whole, those special moments tend to be marked by music. Mm. I mean, there could be societies where that's not true, but certainly my experience of growing up and living a very long time in Britain, that never changes. That music is always part of the everyday, even if the actual music changes. And, you know, it's quite an interesting history to see how music works, just to show how different sorts of music made their way into, say, what song was heard in a football match. You know, or the thing I always used to be amused um, in Britain, and I don't know quite what the terms would be in the States, but we have fairs that come around perhaps once a year. A fair, group, a fair will announce arrive in a small town, and there will be various sorts of things like sh shooting of targets and going on on elaborate roundabouts and all those things. And there's always a lot of music being played. <clears throat> and um, you can see over the years how that music changes. You've suddenly got a moment when those fears were playing punk, which you know seemed quite odd, but nobody seems to think it's odd. And I was talking to a fairground historian about this, and he said his favorite example of that was that they had a thing called a waltzer which is where you go around and around on a chair, which is also going like that simultaneously. So you're, you're being made and it's moving in all directions. <clears throat> and in the middle, there's a guy who's sitting in, a, in this little hut. Um, and when records came, he used to, have to sit in that hut and put the needle on the record, even as the whole thing was going like that. And I had an incredible elaborate set of ball bearings to keep that really flat where everything else was moving. But so that regarded as a highly skilled job in the background. And I thought, you know, just interesting. They were just adapting to the music technology and the music that was turning around them. Sweet. <laughs> um, I think relative to Simon's project, mine was a little more, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to say conventional, but uh, I'll come back to something I said before about how for me, a fundamental way of defining my subject was thinking about live music as a public phenomenon. So I made a decision from the start that I was not going to, for instance, think about things that involve making music in the home. Uh, because really, like, it was a matter of like, if I try to write about that, I'm basically writing about everything in the whole world, and I can't do that. So 
it seemed like that was a pretty fundamental line drop that live music for me was going to be things that were happening in public. Now, things that happen in public can happen in a crowd of 12 or it can happen in a crowd of 12,000 or more. And um, on that score, I think a lot of what I, you know, a lot of the decisions I made about what to include and whatnot had to do partly with my understanding of the time period I was looking at and partly with what sources I could find. It was definitely also a story I wanted to tell. Um, and that story involved a lot of crowds. So I'll come back to the Grand Funk Railroad, right? <laughs> my stone. Right? Um, I mean, part of what fascinated me about Grand Funk Railroad was the way that their audiences at, were discussed in the early 70s by various commentators as a very particular and significant kind of crowd, a crowd of rock fans of a very particular sort. And working back from that, you know, Gina, I want to also kind of give a call out to Gina Arnold, who I don't think is part of the audience here today, but um, in her book on music festivals, um, you know, she her, the subtitle of her book is Crowds and Freedom, right? And it's a play on Elias Kennedy's Crowds and Power. And she and I, I think, have some really similar ways of thinking about why crowds matter and how crowds are just really inextricable from this history of live music that we are all talking about. Um, so for me, I was really interested in how live music so often um, engenders a very particular sort of discourse about the audience and that the audience discourse is often about crowds. And the bigger the crowd, the more kind of anxiety resides around that discourse. And the more the people making the observations seem to think is at stake. Uh, and so being able to see like that there was this discourse about the crowds that came to see Jenny Lind in the 1850s and then there was this discourse about the crowds that would be going to vaudeville in the 1880s and 1890s and then there was this discourse about the audiences that were going the crowds that were going to see Benny Goodman in the 1930s and it's just like this ongoing pattern um where the history of live music in many ways can almost be boiled down to like the changing social perception and definition of large groups of people. Uh, so in that score, I would say what I was looking at was not a straightforward manifestation of everyday life, except that crowds happen in everyday life too. But I think they're often viewed as a very exceptional thing that happens in everyday life. Uh, and I wanted to understand what made musical crowds particularly seem to be exceptional in a particular way. Uh, so that is how I would explain the way in which I thought about my subject relative to how it did and did not dovetail with the sort of broader contours of daily life. Thank you both. Um, we'll have to try to go into slightly quicker. We got a bunch of questions starting to pile up. Um, Anna, you wanted to follow up directly on what we were just talking about? Yeah, hi, so it's wonderful, and it's a joy to see you both, and um, I am particularly, I'm starting a new project, just starting a new project about the relationship between social dancing, vernacular dance, and music, so my question for both of you would be about that, um, and it seems completely related to what we've just been talking about, both in terms of participatory or everyday music versus presentational or special music, as people have been talking about in the chat, and also, Steve, in terms of this idea, this question of what is a crowd, because it seems to me there was a turning point, uh, perhaps a cyclical turning point. And I wonder, Simon, if you saw this in your research as well, where a dancing crowd meant one thing and a standing or swaying or crushing crowd meant another thing, not like dancing ever stopped. I mean, people danced to Grand Funk as well as to swing, you know, or whatever. But I wondered about the role of dance and dancing in your uh, studies of live music. That's, I'll keep it as broad as that. Whatever you want to say about it, I'm interested. Um, very briefly, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question. The, one of the things we discovered talking to promoters from the 1950s when they started becoming a mass, a mass popular youth music was that this 
job that if you put on jazz in ballrooms, particularly at a live jazz band, you actually got a conflict between two sorts of audience. Hmm. There were people who went there to dance and didn't really care what the band looked like, and there were people who went there to watch the band, to look at the band, hmm. and they got in each other's ways. <laughs> so there was there was the promoter's solution to that. Humphrey Lipson was a famous British jazz musician, and his promoter decided the only solution was to put on two gigs on the same night, um, a dancing gig and a kind of huh. I got interested in how talk arguments with an audience is about people going shh, you know, people who want to listen to me and people who want to make noise. But we discovered there was quite a, a different history between people who wanted to dance and people who wanted to watch. But then when disco came along, I think it's one of the effects of Saturday Night Fever in Britain, is that you got an interesting thing where the people dancing became the spectacle. Mm -hmm. So a lot of... Um, Disco clubs in Britain, particularly the more affluent ones, it would be very common for the, the people who were good dancers to be dancing and everybody else to be watching them. And eventually, so in the history of, of black dance in Britain, dancing, the dancers became the kind of became the centre of attention. There were dancing competitions, and you read about people say, when they first went to Northern Soul clubs, they were staggered by what they saw doing and think they couldn't go on the floor. So mm. they'd go home and practice it so they felt they were confident enough to go and perform. So I think the interesting there is that dancers became the spectacle mm. in, in certain sorts of, in certain sorts of, certainly in the sort of disco, uh, disco through to certain sorts of black dance. Hmm. Hmm. And that still continues. Now I, I was looking at a, a picture of a, a dance party here in Nashville and they had dancers on the stage, dancers on the stage. Yeah. They were the show, you know, yeah. so interesting. Thank you. I will try to be brief. Um, I mean, definitely dance matters to this history in all kinds of ways. Um, I think there's such a politics of a sort to whether an audience is seen, as you say, and as a dancing crowd or not. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think a sitting crowd is another thing too, right? And mm -hmm. so there's, you mentioned more like the dancing versus the standing and the crushing, but there's also the sitting crowd, right? Mm -hmm. And I think in the sort of high-low vision it's often the scene crowd that's valorized mm -hmm. right and you do see um a lot of these instances where as music's like I, I think in the histories of both jazz and rock you see a certain broad shift where as the music starts to try to gain more legitimacy dance starts to be you know stigmatized more right um but as like Chris J. Wells and others have pointed out, there's there's no like straight line or stark line you can draw between dance happens before this point and stops happening after this point. Like mm -hmm. the dancing is always happening, but it's where it's happening and under what circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, looking at jazz, especially in the early jazz history, um, I think it matters so much that jazz a was primarily seen as a dance music. Mm -hmm. um, so when I mentioned that contract of the original Dixieland jazz band, like part of their like one sentence definition of jazz was it has to be danceable, right? Mm -hmm. That was like mm -hmm. in contract in 1918. Mm -hmm. um, but 1918 is also when you have lots of groups that are being described as jazz groups being booked into vaudeville theaters, which is not a dance venue at all. Mm -hmm. And so even in that formative moment when I think jazz is generally considered to have been dance music, it was also being presented in a theatrical setting where it wasn't to be danced to. Hmm. And I think that is not insignificant when you start to think about how we get to someone like Paul White who's trying to, you know, legitimize jazz, but like he's not doing it in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same thing happens with rock. I'll just briefly mention like, one of the sources I found that was most interesting along the way uh, with regard to rock stuff was in um, some papers I found at the Rock Hall from um, the files of Ralph Gleason. Mm -hmm. And he had saved this letter that someone wrote to him where he, the person basically complained that you couldn't dance at the Fillmore anymore mm -hmm. because Bill Graham was letting too many people in and the crush of the crowd didn't allow any room to dance. And this person was complaining, right? Um, but, you know, I think we often look at that moment and say people stopped dancing because they were just like listening to the music and taking it really seriously. And Graham himself has actually said that. 
But then you get this other explanation, which is like, there were just too many people to build the dance because Graham was selling too many tickets. And that's like a whole other explanation for why dancing have not been as prevalent as it had been. You think about arenas and it's like, well, yeah, you can kind of dance in an arena, but it's kind of the same thing. Right. right? right. So like, I think uh, for me, a lot of what thinking about dancing means is also thinking about how things like a venue matter mm -hmm. to the way that an audience is going to be more likely to engage with the music that is being put out there. Thank you. Yeah. Let me, thank you all. Let me bring Terrence in. Hi, uh, I just wanna say thanks for, for a great topic and conversation. And I had a question that I, I guess initially it was a question, but the more I think about it, it's more maybe a political question. And those are, uh, artists who've created their own spaces or venues or events, uh, you know, and, and the history of that when people started doing that, I was thinking kind of initially in, in the punk scene and afterwards, but if there are earlier instances of that, then the motivation for that, if there are instances, if there, there are situations where or genres or scenes were excluded from, you know, the, the status quo venues and had to create their own, uh, just a place or politically motivated, motivated like anti-capitalist movements to, you know, create your own venues and opt out of the existing system of venues. Um, the answer very quickly is yes. <laughs> um, I think we discovered, I mean, musicians are very significant promoters and they'll promote themselves when nobody else will promote them. Um, and the thing is you have to then develop and find a space that you can put, and put music on in. Um, which often means, I mean, it's not, in, most musicians can't, it's amazing how in, ingenious people can be to find places where they can put music on. Um, but one of the things that interests me is, is how certain sorts of what you might call exper loosely experimental new music, mm -hmm. in a sense, it flourishes in a place where there's an audience around for it, which you, tends to be in you know, particular parts of New York or in our research, particular parts of certain big cities, often around where art schools were and so on. But it's certainly the case that there are lots of musicians who um, can't play normal, but are kept out of venues. That's part of the history of black music in Britain. Um, this has been very difficult for black musicians to find find venues that they could play in. But it, and it's, it's politics that works always. I mean, when, when the um, British National Party, which is a right-wing fascist party, decided on the policy of attracting youth putting on music they find it very difficult to find venues that were willing to put them on um so you know the politics works works in lots of different ways but yes um venues can certainly be closed to certain sorts of people for lots of different reasons and people will have to find them in their own news mm -hmm. i'll just quickly add that i think for me one of the more interesting questions that stems from this uh issue is whether having a venue that's mainly reserved for a particular style of music is a mark of privilege or a mark of exclusion, you know? So I think to me, like it's a different, it's not an artist run space, but right. Like the classical music concert hall was built to house one kind of music and it was designed largely to exclude most other kinds of music until a point at which it didn't. But, you know, Simon's reference to new music composers, like, even going back to the 1920s, like experimental composers of the 20s were having to create their own venues because the established class music concert halls didn't want to play their music, right? And um, so I think there has, and, and then by the same token, when you move into the world of jazz, jazz want, some jazz people wanted to be able to move into the classical music hall because they saw it as like being is it becoming more legitimate and gaining more privilege. But then there were other jazz artists that really wanted to assert autonomy and create a space that was just for them. And I think that's more what we think of as sort of music led thing is like that push for autonomy, which is absolutely right. Um, but I think that exclusion, you know, it, I think it can sometimes be a little blurry as to whether like the that push for your own space or that push for a genre specific space is coming from a place of being marginalized or is coming from a place of privilege. Um, and I can sometimes be a little bit of both at once. Um, 
you know, and, and I, I think the sort of new music thing is a good example of that, uh, which is another reason why to me, as I dug deep into this project, some of those lines between like high and low and not just started to be a lot less meaningful. Um, because I think at the ground level, you know, like what do you, what do you call an avant-garde performance space that on an average night draws 50 people by line? You know, um, if it's self-selectingly exclusionary, is that because they're marginalized or is that because they just thrive in a space where it's good to have your boundaries? All roads lead to Zorn. Okay. Um, 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 Zoe. Hey, uh, for the talk, Steve and Simon, uh, uh, I had a question about gear. Um, so I'm wondering about how things sound and if there's like a technological aspect to the stories that y'all are telling in terms of, I mean, Steve, you talked about this a little bit in terms of producing a show, right? And like writing, lighting rigs and things like that. But I'm wondering if, if if these promoters, whether it's the, the government or these independent promoters, like care that much about how things sound. Uh, yeah, I guess that's that's the question. Uh, um, so. Promoters care because they can only get bands. Certain sort of, when bands started caring about sounds, promoters had to too. Mm -hmm. um, and there are two issues really, and this is very much what the history of the rock part of this is. A, And in Britain, they just weren't venues that take those people. Um, so you had to start playing in things like football grounds, which meant you needed to have different, better sound. And the whole development of a sound system around rock is very kind of technological. Um, but it also has interesting side effects. So that in the 1950s in Britain and th through the 1960s, and, and really on for quite a long time after that, the basic space where many bands played when they went on tour was cinemas. Mm. And that's because cinemas already had a reasonably decent sound system um, compared with what clubs had, you know, tied in with their showing films. And so, you know, if you look at the early Beatles British tours, 75% of the places they played would have been um, would have been cinemas and the rest would have been um, town halls or, or, or old variety theatres. So I think technology was a significant thing really from quite early on. But once you had to start thinking about how you could use bigger spaces, picking out door space, then there will own us on promoters to come up with technological systems. And the, the, the audio engineering industry responded and saw there was a there was money to be made out of producing the right sort of speakers and amplifiers and so on. Yeah, I want to oh were you done Simon or did you have something else? Yeah, my last, that's, yeah. Okay. I'm done. I, I wanted to give a shout out to somebody who's on, in the audience here, John Kane, who wrote a really detailed, thorough um, book on the sound engineer Hanley. And it's by far the best published account of the audio engineering side of live music that anybody's done so far. So I strongly recommend checking that book out. Um, I have a short section on Bill Hanley in my own book. Um, I, you know, am indebted to John for some of his research. I did my own research well, um, but Hanley was really crucial and was somebody who a lot of promoters wound up relying on. His initial career started with like Newport uh, Jazz and Folk Festival, so he was primarily working with George Ween, the promoter, uh, and Ween specifically had a real interest in putting on the best possible quality show that he could, and was a part of that. Um, and, um, but eventually Hanley was doing sound for the Beatles. He was doing sound at Wood, he did sound at Woodstock. He, he became the festival sound person. Um, I think music festivals particularly played a significant role in um, defining what kind of infrastructure was necessary for a certain kind of live music event that then got further codified and then professionalized in the era of arena rock. Um, you know, when Hanley started his company, he was really like one of a very few people who had the sort of skill and capability to be able to put together those kinds of sound systems. By the time you get to the 70s, there are companies that are proliferating more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same is true with lighting. The same is true with pretty much all the different technical dimensions. Um, and I, I think what's happening is you see this kind of 
professionalization across the board. The promoters themselves are going about their work in a more professionalized way. Uh, and then all the technical uh, workers who help to support those shows are professionalizing as well. So it's, it's a really crucial part of the story, I would say. Um, and it was, it was very much made into a priority by the 70s for sure, uh, and then just continued to grow from there. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, we're running low on time, but Maya, can you ask your question? Maya? Sorry, sorry, <laughs> get the mute. Uh, hi, everyone, thanks so, so much. Um, yeah, my question was just to see, I really enjoy hearing the sort of British and American traditions of live music. And I was wondering if your research took you to um, uh, other linguistic spaces, right? So I'm particularly interested in France and the Francophone world and live music there, but just more generally in non-English language spaces, if you've done any research or witnessed any phenomena in those. I mean, unfortunately, I have not really delved into that much. Uh, and it was one of those things that I you know, I mean, my project is very much a project about live music in the U.S. Now, that doesn't, of course, we know there's a lot of not English speaking spaces in the U.S. Um, I do not have great non-English speaking skills myself, so I didn't really like open that up. I think there's a real need for more work in that area, especially around um, Spanish speaking venues and Span the whole kind of economy of Latinx music in the U.S. Um, I think that there's a history. I didn't cover that history really at all. And I, I wish I had covered it more. Um, so I would say that is a huge gap that I hope someone else comes along to fill. Um, I think by the same token, you know, with ter in terms of like um, Caribbean sound cultures and live music cultures, something else that there's some good documentation on already, but there's a lot more work to do in that vein. So, I mean, I mean my short answer is no, I didn't really get into that. But I'm excited to see people open this up more. And, you know, I, I do think what I saw, from Simon, I mentioned this earlier, um, helped to organize this great conference on live music in, back in 2011. That was really the first academic conference on the subject. And most of it was very much like British US perspectives. Um, but I think the, the research interest in this field has been growing quite a bit in the last 10 years or so. And, um, I think we can expect that there's going to be a lot more work being done on Francophone, on German, um, on non-Western various cultures and their live music scenes and systems. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that the work that I've done can be in conversation with that as the, the sort of field such as it is moves forward. Um, it's a really important thing to ask about though. So thank you for the question. Yeah, I mean, we... In, and we didn't do a very adequate job, but we did try to reflect on all the different sorts of live music kind of musicians and venues and promoters that emerged from different from different sectors of British culture, <clears throat> not so much different languages, although Welsh and, and, and Gaelic sort of looking. The thing that I would regret, and if we'd had another volume I would have done, would be not so much following that work, although it should be done, but also is the relationship between British live music and other, other places. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting that we had to start out volume three because it's the most recent period by a long chapter, which simply describes three American corporations, mm. Live Nation, Ticketmaster and AEG, because they totally dominated British live music industry by that stage. And we had to take account of what their thinking was and what they were doing. But I think in, in terms of the, the longer period, um, the relationship between Britain and Europe is actually, in terms of musicians and, and gigs and traveling from one to the other, is interesting, particularly because I think British culture is, is a very insular culture in lots of ways. So British bands took it for granted that they would make a living playing in Europe, you know, right back to playing on army bases and American army bases in Germany and so on. Uh, the Beatles going and playing in Hamburg. But there's been very little movement of non of, of European musicians seeing Britain as a place where they can make a living and if they become big stars of their craft work, possibly, obviously. But I think in terms of, you know, day-to-day -day musicians, 
get very little traffic across across the border in that sense and obviously things are being made much worse by brexit a sad note to have to end on as our final word for tonight um um steve simon thank you so much um for a great conversation where both of you could easily go 90 minutes on any of these questions um <laughs> so thank you for for your books and, and and all you had to share tonight hang around for a second um, thanks to everybody else. In two weeks, we come back with Shante Paradigm Smalls, Hip Hop Heresies, Queer Aesthetics in New York City. So thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Carl, you want to hit pause? Um, maybe he doesn't. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Only Carl can stop the recording. <laughs>